Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Firestone. I'm an engineer on the register team. Uh, I do mostly iOS engineering. I've been here for a while, so I've seen a whole bunch of problems. Uh, one thing about our register code base is that it's probably one of the biggest systems that we have. And you can't ship part of, a, of an iOS app. You have to ship the whole thing. So unlike server or web or something like that. So one of the big things that comes down to is how do you make this a manageable code base and how do you break it into smaller pieces that can be managed by different teams? Uh, one of the best patterns that I've found to do this is something called dependency injection. And this is something that's not widely used with iOS or Mac, but it's a very popular pattern in Java or uh, C Sharp, some other ones. Uh, there's no reason that it can't be used on this in uh, Swift or Objective-C, so I want to go into some of the ways you can use that in your app. Uh, another point here, I wrote a long blog post about this Friday, so you can check out corner.squareapp.com if you missed any of the details or you want to dig into this some more. I'm going to split the talk up into three sections what dependency injection is, why you might want to use it, and assuming you do want to use it, how you can start applying that to your code base. So first question, what is dependency injection? And it's really, it's a fancy name for a very simple concept. I guarantee you've been using this already, you just may not have known it, and you can actually just increase that usage to make your code base even cleaner. So let's illustrate this using some traditional code. Let's say you want to create a race car. You're going to call alloc init, it'll create your race car, and then as part of doing that, that's going to create an engine. And then eventually, at the end of this, you've created a whole bunch of these objects just by creating that race car initially. The way that tradition, uh, and then your, your code will look something like this. You call init on the race car. The race car will call init on the engine and the transmission, et cetera. With dependency injection, we're going to flip that around a little bit. So you start by creating the smallest objects and you use those to compose the bigger ones. And then finally, at the end, you have that same graph. Uh, one thing to point out here is that the ownership is exactly the same. You use this in exactly the same way that you would the first one. It's just that when you're creating it, you're kind of creating it backwards. And the code is a very simple change from what we had before. You're passing in the engine and the transmission rather than creating them directly. And then you just hold on to them so you can still use them when you need them. All right, so that's it. That's dependency injection. But why is this a good thing? I like to call the three uh, main benefits the three Cs. And those are clarity. It's going to clear up your code base. Customizability, it makes your existing classes much more easy to use in more situations. And it helps with separation of concerns. So let's talk about clarity and how this can help. Initially, you probably had one big object and it had a bunch of little things in it. And they were all configured and uh, tied together in various ways. And it wasn't very clear how that was happening because it's all within the one object. If you use dependency injection, you have an engine that has a clear API, a transmission that has a clear API. And the race car has to use those. So it's very clear how they all interact with each other. Fine, uh, as the caller, the person creating this race car, there's one point you now have to worry about. And that's creating that race car, the initialization. Previously, you might have had some globals or shared instances that were used throughout the code base. And you don't really know they're down there. Now they're all in that initializer. And you know if you're missing something. And because of that, you don't have unexpected interactions. If a race car is going to change the behavior of another race car, it's because you pass them both the same object. They can't use any hidden dependencies. One really important part of uh, development at Square is testing. We think it's a big, big benefit to everything. And so dependency injection helps with testing quite a bit. Uh, as you notice, you have all these dependencies being injected. You have all these uh, arguments to the initializer. So you know exactly what's going into your black box. It makes it a lot easier to figure out what goes in and what, and what the causes are that make behavior come out. Pardon me. <clears throat> and again, because of this, you don't have any hidden dependencies. There's no globals. There's no singletons. Uh, it causes a lot fewer try it now, um, when you're try it now operations when you're doing your tests. You pass in things. You get behavior. There's nothing else that you forgot to set up in the same way that you, forgot to, uh, that you set it up in your production app. All right, customizability. You have a lot more control over your objects now, because you're passing in parts of the behavior. So let's say we have a race car, and it always took an engine and a transmission. But now we want to add some new behavior. We want to create a faster race car. Well, we can use a bigger engine. And as long as it behaves the same as that first engine, we don't have to change our race car code at all. So all of our tests still work. We don't have to change large portions of the code and worry about breaking something. This also means that you can handle exceptional cases a lot better. Maybe your race car always had a five-speed transmission. But all of a sudden, you have a new race car that needs a six-speed. Well, that one-off uh, one race car, you can just pass in the six-speed transmission. And again, you're not creating weird edge cases within your main object. And again, this helps in testing. So in that same way that we had a big engine, we can put in a mock engine. 
And this helps with not consuming resources. So we don't have to actually hit the network or the disk. We can add additional logging to make sure our tests are working correctly. Uh, another thing is that it means that our tests are much better contained. Rather than using a single TIN that's shared throughout the app, we can create a, a single instance per test. And the result of that is that one test can't influence another one because you're setting up and tearing down every single thing, every test. And finally, separation of concerns. So you really want a class to focus on being what it is and not on configuration. With dependency injection, your race car can focus on being a race car. It's not about tying together the engine and the transmission and a bunch of other configuration. It also means that you can uh, compose rather than subclassing, and there's uh, some additional talk about this on the website and uh, just on the, the internet in general. <laughs> Composing will drastically clear up your code. So previously, you might have had to, if you wanted a, an efficient race car and a fast race car, you might have had to subclass each and then override the accelerate method. And you have some weird behavior in there. Your tests have to be re-added. Uh, with dependency injection, most of your code stays the same. You have a race car and you just create a new engine that has the new behavior. It's well contained to that engine. And again, because you, you're going from one big component to a bunch of little components, it's much easier to reason about what each of those pieces does. And again, this helps in testing. So now your, your classes are all about behavior. They're all about business logic, which means you can test the whole class. You don't have to worry about, well, is this configuration, and I, it might change, and I don't need to worry about it. All of your code is good code worth testing. The smaller classes mean you have a smaller test interface. As most of you probably know, it's easier to test uh, 10 objects that have one method than it is to test one object that has 10 methods. Fewer subclasses mean rep uh, fewer repeated tests. Every time you subclass, you really need to test that object to make sure all of the behaviors are the same because you might have changed some little piece that has a cascading effect. And the clearer purpose makes the test more obvious. If you have a very specific purpose for an, an object, you kind of know what it's supposed to do. One point I want to make here, I've been talking about something called constructor injection this whole time. There's an alternative called setter injection. You'll see this, there's a little bit more talk about this in the blog post, and you'll see this throughout other articles on the web. Uh, very, very simple. Constructor injection, you're going to pass your dependencies in through the initializer, like I was saying. Setter injection is literally just using properties. So rather than uh, instantiating something within the object, you're going to assign it via a, a property. So the question is, when do you use each of these? And that's also pretty simple. Use constructor injection if you can. If you can't, fall back to setter injection. All right, so hopefully this is a pattern you like and you want to get started. One really nice thing about de uh, dependency injection is you can literally take five minutes, make a small change, commit it, and improve your code base, and you don't have to do all or nothing. I'm going to describe a few ways that you can do this, and uh, they'll, if you use them continuously, eventually you'll have a really nice code base. Number one, remove globals. This is one of the leading uh, reasons for fragility in our code base because you have this shared state that you didn't know you had. And removing them is very simple. Go and find where they're referenced, move them to an argument in the initializer. Just pass them in and then eventually they're all going to go away. And this is going to sound kind of crazy, but you actually want to do this for some of the singletons that Cocoa provides. So you may only ever use one NS notification center in your app, but in your test you probably want one per test. And this provides that ability. Your old code on the left there, like I said, you're going to reference that default manager, that shared singleton, move that into the initializer, and then just hold on to it until you need it. And uh, this is one that I kind of mentioned before, but you want to remove any direct allocation within the object itself. So as I call my setup code for an object, I'm going to go ahead and just move those into the initializer. But what happens if you want to initialize something later? It's not during the setup code. You may never need it, so you don't want to initialize it and then waste it. You may need five of them, but you don't really know how many yet. Uh, we're going to use something called a factory initializer, and this is really just a fancy name for a block. So let's say you have a refuel method, and you don't know how many times this is going to get called, but every time you need a new funnel. Well, we want to be able to specify which funnel class is being used. So we can, call it, we can uh, pass in a block that creates that funnel, hold on to it, and then every time we need a funnel, we just call the block. So now the caller can still customize which uh, class is being used there, but we can create as many as we want. And as a caller, this is kind of what it looks like. So you just create a very simple block that returns the object you want and pass that down. And what this gives you is the ability, you can now create zero to n of these things, but you don't have to worry about what the actual implementation is. As you do this, you're going to start to add more and more arguments to your initializers. 
And what you can do is start to simplify that down. So if you're, if you're adding more than about three arguments to your initializers, start to figure out ways that you can logically combine them. And the layers will fall out sort of naturally. So in our old code, like I said, we had a race car. Everything's done internally. As we separate those out, we have an initializer, an initializer with a bunch of arguments. But you'll notice that a camshaft and a, pist a piston are part of an engine. A flywheel and a clutch are part of a transmission. So we can go ahead and bundle those together into more objects. And you can actually move some of the logic that makes sense in those objects out as well. And then finally, you're probably saying, OK, this means I have to create a lot of extra objects every time I want to use any of these objects that require them as arguments. Well, we have, an we have a solution for that as well, uh, especially if there's only, one logical there's only one logical option for sticking that in there. Uh, so what we're going to do is use something called a class convenience initializer. And Coco uses these pretty heavily already. So think of using ns string string rather than alloc init. Or ns hash table is a good one. Their initializer takes a whole bunch of arguments, but most of the time you just want a weak hash table, and they provide a convenience for that. So here's a concrete example. Let's say we have a paint job object that we want to create. You're going to customize the color every time, but most of the time you want to use the same mixer, the same paint gun, the same paint, paint cartridges. Those almost never change. So we'll create a factory method here that does that. And we use that stock paint mixer and paint gun, et cetera, and we call that longer initializer. You'll notice the one thing that's being passed in is the color, which changes every time. And now as the caller, it's very simple. It's the same as it was before. And that's it. So now your code should hopefully be a lot cleaner, a lot easier to track the dependencies, and a lot more testable. This is how you can get in touch with me. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I'll be around uh, after this for the Q&A.